Good afternoon. Um, this is um, CIBE 634, Surface Water Hydrology, uh, class uh, 132, 13 weeks, second class. And the subject today is going to be more detail on the Muskingum Kunj flood routing method. Before I get into, I'm, I'm, I'm going to cover today uh, H7 and H8. Uh, H7 is a paper I wrote, um, and I also prepared a video for that. And then after that, we're gonna do, we're gonna review this Bupalapati and Pons paper. And in here, all of us are gonna have to hold onto our seats because this is a very tough paper. Um, but before I do that, I'm going to run over or go over with you over the details of the Muskingum Kanch method because because that's the meat of this, of this chapter here on channel routing. Because nowadays, people are, are using Muskingum method and, and they're also using Muskingum Kanj, but I would say very few people are using Muskingum Kanj. The only people that are using actually Muskingum Kanj is those that are running HMS. When they run HMS, HMS offers them that they could run Muskingum Kanj and they do it. But there you're not really doing coding or anything like that. We're just, you're just answering questions that the computer developers, which is the Army Corps, are going to ask you, do this, do that, give me the data, give me that data, but you really, really don't know. The only way to know this is to program it, sit down and program it. And there, the chances for you guys to do that, like I said, are very small. There are there, but they're small. Uh, nevertheless, people may like to do some programming. There's always that case. I had a Many years ago, a little story, I had a student that um, had done some reservoir routing. Very good student of mine. Uh, he was one of the top students back in the middle 90s. And I, I invited him to give a lecture, uh, to give a lecture to our students on some subject. And he came some subject and talked about reservoir routing and all this sort of thing. And I was really impressed. So I asked him, I said, what, um, what software did you use? Just out of curiosity. And he said, I wrote it myself. And, and I said, you wrote it yourself? I was surprised. And he says, yeah, I followed your book. <laughs> I was really amazed and pleased that he had said that. So he followed my book in order to write it himself and he could do it. And it can be done not just with the reservoir routing, but with other methods too, even with the Muskingum, even with the Muskingum Kanch. So I'm gonna go today with any further ado to the Muskingum Kanch. And I'm going to explain as I always do, uh, how, wh what's the data in here, okay? So it's, it says, use the constant parameter masking on kanch method. Constant parameter, what, are you, what, what am I talking about? Well, there's two ways to do the masking on kanch, constant parameter and variable parameter. And I'll get to that later on in the next publication. To route a flood wave with the following flood and channel characteristics. Route a flood wave, what does that mean? A flood wave is a flood wave. And, and if you route it, it means that you're pursuing the wave as it moves downstream and trying to figure out its speed, meaning its celerity, and its, its rate of attenuation. That's all there is to it. A <laughs> very complex subject. Uh, uh, Seven discovered the celerity of, of a flood wave in the year 1900. And then it took 55 years for the British people, mathematicians, by the way, Lighthead and Whittem, to come out and, and set the, the record, rather set the theory straight on the stuff that, that um, Seddon had done in the year 1900 with using some theory, but not using all the theory. So we reckon that uh, it was due to Lighthead and Whittem that the scientists like myself and others were able to really dig into and understand the concept of kinematic wave in the concept of routing because kinematic wave is one way of routing. Remember, I said there's three waves, the kinematic diffusion and dynamic. So let's move back in here. The following flood characteristics. Well, so you're giving us some flood characteristics. This means already uh, that we need some characteristics of the flood in order to route it. Otherwise, we, what are we gonna do, right? So I'm giving you here the minimum characteristics that needed to be, uh, so in order to, uh, for us to apply the method. And this, by the way, this is a classical example. It is a very, very simplified example. In practice, examples are gonna be much more complex. So the peak flow, 
Q sub P equal a thousand cubic meters per second. These are round numbers. The base flow is zero. The channel bottom slope S sub O equals 0 0.000868. The flow area at peak discharge, flow area at peak discharge. So we have a peak discharge and we have a flow area at peak discharge. So that means that we're gonna be routing, routing this uh, Muskingum Kanch for a constant parameter at peak discharge, because I already given you the, the discharge and the area. The top width at peak discharge, so I've given the area and the top width. So I've basically given you already a kind of the shape of the cross section, right? And not only that, for this example, I'm giving you the rating exponent, beta equal to 1.6. What's the standard beta for a wide channel? Is five thirds, so that's 1.67. So 1.6, that means that this is not quite a rectangular channel. It is probably trapezoidal. Uh, wide, but yet wide, 1.6, because 1.6 is for trapezoidal channels that are wide. 1.5 will be trapezoidal channels that are not that wide. And by the time they get to 1.33, they're triangular. They're not trapezoidals. We know that, and I already talked about that. Then the delta X, the delta X is 4.4 kilometers. So that is one reach, 14.4 kilometers. It seems long, but yet that's the way we have to do it. Uh, typically, these things are done for much longer than 14 kilometers, maybe 50, 100 kilometers, right? Uh, at any rate, this delta X is needed in here in, as such because I have to set the current number at one, and the delta X defines the current number. So I had to try in here, try to make sure I got a good number in here for the show. It's a, this is a show, actually, show how it's done, right? So... But the delta X, my comment in here is that the delta X 14 kilometers is not that long. Okay, never mind that the river is not straight. The river is going to go around and curve in a typical meandering fashion. And meandering is something interesting and important. Uh, the sinuosity ratios could vary anywhere from between 1.5 to 3 or 4 or 5. And, and how is it that we're going to straighten this river and then calculate it? But we do it because, I guess because God is great, we do it that way. Okay, in the time interval, delta T equal one hour. I had to set the time interval equal to one hour because I wanted a round number in there. And then I had to back calculate the delta X equal 14.4. But what do you mean by calculate? Did I know the answer? No, but I know that the current number has to be around one. And I'll explain to that later on why. Okay, so we will find the mean velocity. I gave you the inflow and the inflow is just a triangular hydrograph. Zero at the beginning, zero at the end, after 10 hours. And at five hours, it's 1,000. It goes to 200, 400, 600, 800, and 1,000. Let me get in here a little bigger. There you go. The mean, the, the mean velocity is Q over A for the peak discharge. We're going to base our calculation on the peak discharge. So it's 2.5 meters per second. The wave celerity is C equal beta V. That's four because it's, 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 the beta is 1.6 times 2.5 is four, four meters per second. That's the celerity. That's not uncommon, by the way. The flow per unit of width is QP, Q sub P over T sub P. That's 10 meters square per second. The current number is, and we do the calculation, and it turns out to be one. That's cool. We needed a current number equal one. And let me say at this point, something like this. The current number is fundamental in this calculation. If you don't pay attention to the current number, you're going to mess up. The current number has to be one or very close to one. If it's 0.9, no big deal. If it's 1.1, no big deal. But if it's 0.5, you'll get trash out of the computation. And if it's 0.1, it'll be violently at you, hitting you. So you have to be careful the current number could not be, could not deviate too much from one. Now, what happens if current number is four? It doesn't blow up, but it gives you the wrong answer. So instead of giving you, for instance, if the answer is 100, it gives you 50. And of course that's wrong, you know? Uh, we can accept a certain degree of error, but not 50%, but it'll give you that 50 if you're using four or five or even larger than that. So the cell, current num the cell Reynolds number, which comes from the num from equation 19 971 is D equal 0.2. And uh, then the routing coefficients are, from there we can find the routing coefficients from the equations that we have developed over here. From th there it is, 974, 975, and 976. We already have C, which is one, and D equal 0.2, and we get, the, we get the routing coefficients. The coefficients are 0.09, 0.81, and 0.09.
So that means that the, the summation of these three has to be equal to one, otherwise we're not doing it correctly. It is confirmed that the sum of the routing is equal to one. The calculations are shown in table 9A. So look at this, the inflow is already defined. That's, that's inflow, 200, 400, 600, 800, 1,000, 800, 600, 400. So how is this, how is this um, wave going to move in time and space? That's what we're doing, calculating in time and space. Okay, this is different from basic hydraulics. In basic hydraulics, what you may remember, uh, for instance, you did the uh, water surface profiles and there was no time involved in the water surface profile. It was all space. But in here, there's time and space. So they, they gotten more complicated, or more, more complex. So we do the routing in a normal fashion based on this equation here. Where is it? There it is, this equation, 962, 962. So we do the routing based on 962 and we get this outflow. And look at the outflow, the peak inflow was a thousand. So the peak outflow has to be less than a thousand, right? And what is it? 963. And when is, does it occur? The peak inflow occurred at five hours. It was a thousand. The peak outflow was 963 and it occurred at six hours. And the peak, the peak, the, the inflow returned to zero at 10, 10 hours. But at 10 hours, the outflow was still at 200. That means we had some diffusion and spreading of the hydrograph. If there was diffusion, there had to be spreading. You cannot diffuse without spreading because the volume has to be conserved, conserved right? You understand that. If, you, if the hydrograph gets decreased in, in height or in intensity, rather, in discharge, then it has to spread out. Why? Because the integral of QDT has to be equal to the volume. And the volume in the inflow has to be equal to the volume of the outflow. Okay, and the mass kingdom conch is very, very good, well in mass, cons mass conservation. So it's fine. So this calculation is fine. Uh, this, this may be the first um, routing that some of you do or have seen. And I'll tell you a story, which is a good story. It's a, it's a family story. My daughter went to school over in, on the East Coast and she studied, what do you think? Civil engineering, my daughter, okay? And uh, she took hydrology. They took hydrology when you study civil engineering, right? And professor, uh, it, was, it was interesting that her professor had, had reviewed my book. When my book was up for review, I don't remember the name of the guy, but he had reviewed the book and he was familiar with my book. So he was using my book. So he recommended that the students buy Professor Ponce's book. And uh, so the issue came up in class that, was was I related to the author, or rather was my daughter related to the author of the book? So that was an interesting experience for my daughter. So one day she came up and says, uh, Dad, I am really happy. I feel like I done, some, done something really good. I said, what did you do? And she says, I did my first routing in your chapter eight, reservoir routing. That's the kind of stuff that, that the student remember he did. It's kind of nice to do the rest of the routing. It's pretty straightforward. It's, it's not as complex as channel routing. But at any rate, he, she was happy that she had done her first routing. So that's the end of that story. So now we're going to come in here and we're going to go to um, the story that I, not the story, but the paper that I wrote in the year, it was not 2011, it's 2020, look at this. So I made a mistake in there. I, I'm not free from making mistakes, okay? So it's over here, a Muskingum Kanch method explained. This paper was put into a video because at the time, <laughs> you wanna know this, at the time we had a pandemic in the year 1920 and I had a lot of time to do videos. So a lot of the stuff that I did was in the 1920, 21, we really hit the roof in the videos because we had a lot of time in our hands. So that was the benefit. So Muskingum Kanch method explained. So I'm going to explain here in, not layman terms or layperson's terms. I'm going to explain it for the average engineer because Kanj, he didn't do that. He wrote his paper in 1969 and it was not for the average engineer. It was difficult. We had to spend a lot of time understanding. Finally, we understood it all, but we had to go back and review everything he was talking about and so on and so forth. And I knew it was important and it was important. Let me tell you why because he was trying to control the numerical diffusion. And I already knew that without control of the numerical diffusion, you couldn't solve problems in, in numerical hydraulics. 
because if numerical diffusion got out of control, then the answer was going to look, it was not going to be correct to start. Okay, so we spent all oh, five years, 73 to 78, 79, trying to figure out how this could be done. And finally, Kanj came out and he said, at least for the convection problem, which is not totally the, the complete solution of the same Venn equations, it's just an approximation, then we can do this, he said. And we believed him and we proved that he was correct, in fact, by way of practice, by the way. We applied this many, many times and it always worked. It always worked the way we intended it to work. And basically, I already told you this, uh, mass conservation, uh, consistency, meaning uh, you get the same grid independence. I like, I, I use the word grid independence because, because it, was a, it was a kind of a kind of a neat way of describing the situation. And I believe I, I was about among the very few that introduced the concept of grid independence back in the year late eight seventies and early eighties. So we're going to compare now in here the Muskingum versus the Muskingum Kanch method. The Muskingum Kanch method is a method of flood routing that improves on the classical Muskingum. Where was the where is the classical Muskingum described? It is described by Cho in 1959, Professor Vente Cho from Illinois. He picked it up from 1938. Now, my understanding is that McCarthy wrote the book, wrote the, the developed the method in 1938. He working on the Muskingum River, and he did it for the Army Corps. He was working for the Army Corps of Engineers at the time, 1938. But that manuscript was never published. It was never published. He had not seen the light. I have not been, uh, how can I say, I have not seen the McCarthy manuscript. So we have to believe in Chow because it came out in Chow 21 years later. And by that time, it was very well established. So I don't think Chow made any mistake. Besides, if Chow made a mistake, it would have shown in the computations and it didn't. The method is well behaved. The Muskingum method is well behaved as long as you know the parameters. If you don't know the parameters, it's anybody's guess what you're going to get. You can try the parameters, but it not, it's not going to be correct. They're not going to be physical. It'll be whatever you want to call it. Some people call it hydrological, but I don't think, uh, uh, it, like I said, it depends on the parameters. And the K, it's readily ascribed to the speed of the, of the flood wave through the reach. And since we already know that, it's readily available, it's easy to find the K, but the X was not at the time. So it was conscious contribution to clarify the use and the significance of the X factor in the Muskingum method. Okay, so date of origination, Muskingum 1938, Muskingum Kunch 1969. Original reference, McCarthy, the unit hydrograph and flood routing. Kunch on the subject of, flood of a flood propagation computation method. We believe that the Kunch paper is one of the most important papers ever written in hydraulics. Uh, standard reference, because of its content, the content was profound and important. Standard reference, Chow, right, for Muskingum. In, in our standard reference is for our, um, in our, in our book, we have a book, Fundamentals of Open Channel Hydraulics, section 10.6. Why do I say that? I quote myself. People say, the Profonce likes to quote himself. Well, okay. Let me tell you a story. About a couple of years ago, there's a gentleman working out of Arkansas, a professor at Arkansas, called me up and says, Professor Ponce, I need to learn more about the Muskingum Kanch method. Cool. I said, nice. We'll explain it to you. And he says, you know what? I looked around and nobody, nobody knows and they don't want to talk about it. They all pointing to you. <laughs> I, said, I said, really? That's right, correct. So basically that's why I say here quite plainly that you can find the Muskingum Kanch explained in my book. Okay, nature, hydrologic method. The Muskingum is a hydrologic method. It was developed as a hydrologic method where the routing parameters K and X are calculated by trial and error calibration using a pair of inflow outflow. So you have inflow, you have outflow and you're gonna develop uh, the whys or the looks of the system itself, meaning the channel, okay? The, in the Muskingum Kanch is a hydraulic method because it doesn't rely on hydrographs. The routing parameters K and X are based on the channel morphology as represented by the prevailing channel slope and cross-sectional shape characteristics. Basically it's based, the Muskingum Kanch method is based on the beta and the beta can be calculated by figuring out where, what channel, what's the shape of the cross-section. And the shape of the cross-section can be generally found 
it's not easy, but it can be generally found. Okay, uh, you have to dig dig around and you can't rely only on National Weather Service because the National Weather Service does not get into mass kingdom country calculations, so they don't need the cross section. So you'd have to go, it would have to be a project, I think, in some river that you have to measure this. So it's, it's difficult. For a hypothetical problem, you could always invent stuff, but you realize it's, it's a hypothetical problem is not really completely realistic. Okay, ease of application depends on the availability of major flood hydrographs. So for the Muskingum, you have to have a major flood hydrograph suited for parameter calibration. In the Muskingum Kanch, the availability of geometric and hydraulic data to the extent that this data properly represents the reach under consideration. I should always say that. If it doesn't represent, then you're off. Ease of computation, Muskingum, good with any computational tool, including a spreadsheet. How about that? Very, very, very nice to excel at this point. It's including a spreadsheet, programming, and commercial and government software, right? Uh, the Muskingum is, is part of H HMS. Prior HMS was called HEC1 uh, since, since the 1960s. I'm sorry, say, yeah, 68, 68, 70. Uh, Muskingum Conch is good with any computational tool, including a spreadsheet, programming, available soft, commercial, and, and government software. Yeah, uh, I, I should say this, and I'm gonna say it. Uh, spreadsheet is, is okay, it's nice. The only problem is spreadsheet originated prior to the web. The spreadsheet goes back to the late 80s, beginning 90s, and the web started in 1994. So the spreadsheet is, wasn't really designed for web work. So you can do spreadsheet, all the spreadsheets that you want to do, but don't expect them to put them on the web. And you should though, because now the web is the, the area, the communication and sharing of the, uh, of, of everybody. So if you want to share, then it's not a good way, of, way to go. Accuracy. The Muskingum is good for the reach and event used for calibration. In other words, if you're going to use uh, an event inflow outflow in order to calibrate K and X, the K and X can only be used for the inflow outflow that you're using in the calibration. You cannot use it for some other inflow and outflow. You could use it, but you would be extrapolating wildly that was said by the Army Corps at one time, by the way. The Army Corps said that you, they couldn't use the Muskingum for the, that they, that they calibrated for this uh, event, uh, which was at a certain level, for the, and then extrapolated and used it for this other event, which was either higher or lower. They said that. As a matter of fact, that that's what they say in the, in the publications. What they did at the time, before we had the Muskingum Conj, is what the, that they had three calibrations, low, medium, and large, or, or high stage. And then they the correspondingly varying parameters, K and X, or low, medium, and high. And that, by having three points on the curve, they could approximate what the actual K and X values would look. Now, the Muskingum Kanch, though, very good for all events within the reach, only limited to the extent that hydraulic and geometric data must be representative. There's twice, I've said that twice in here. Why? Because I believe it is important. If you think that stuff is important, you repeat it twice or even three times. Nonlinear flood routing, very limited. The Muskingum, very limited. Usually not available due to large hydrologic data requirements. That's what I was referring to for the Army Corps. The Army Corps found out that they could not use the same K and X for various stages from low to high, which means nonlinear flood routing because it's the, the K is going to change from low, medium, and high. The K and X. If they don't change, then it's not nonlinear, but the world is nonlinear. So they have to admit that. Uh, Muskingum Kanch, available at the cost of additional complexity. Yes, somewhat additional complexity. Uh, in overall assessment, dated method. We believe that the Muskingum is dated, limited in accuracy when used for extensive watershed basin routing. It should not be used. Actually, it could not be used for extensive watershed basin routing. It's impossible. So it's okay for one reach, but not for if you have a hundred reaches. And we have had many, many applications, I would say in the dozens applications where we have done this for a hundred reaches, 200 reaches like that, the Santa Cruz Basin and all uh, other methods or other, the, the stuff that we did for, for the La Leche Basin in Peru, that was, they had about 40, 45 basins. And then the Masquilla Mucanch is a newer method featuring state-of-the-art hydraulic numerical modeling 
ideally suited for extensive watershed and basin routing. That's the way we did it. So let's take a look at Muskingum Kunch and flood waves. The key to the understanding of the theoretical basis of the Muskingum Kunch is the recognition that the diffusion wave applies for, through a wider range of competing waves such as the kinematic and dynamic waves. Kinematic waves do not attenuate. Do the flood waves attenuate? If they do attenuate, they wouldn't be kinematic, okay? While mass flow waves attenuate at least a little bit. On the other hand, dynamic waves attenuate too much and therefore do not represent flood waves. And that's our, our, our bag in here. We're saying that the kinematic waves will not attenuate. So if, you, if, you, if your flood wave is kinematic, so be it, fine. Dynamic waves attenuate too much. And tip, generally speaking, they are not flood waves because the nature of a flood wave is that it sustains its stage. It does not attenuate too much. That's why it floods. If it attenuated a whole lot, it would disappear on your, upon your eyes and then it wouldn't be a flood. It would have uh, com converted, com com converted to be part of the base flow, but that's not the case. Most waves are considered in practice to be diffusion waves. Uh, the British said it in 1975, that said, if the diffusion is zero, it's kinematic. If it's more than 30, it's dynamic. It's between zero and 30 is diffusion. That's what they said, because they had a lot of practice. They routed a lot of these waves. And more than 30, they said dynamic. But in reality, they, they, the dynamic wave is hard to measure because if it's really dynamic, it'll dissipate on, on, upon your eyes. And you couldn't measure it. You couldn't even say it's more than 30. Where is it? Where's the dynamic wave? It disappeared, right? And how, how can we say that? Because we've studied this for 50 years and we know, we know, we, uh, we, uh, we have tried everything in the laboratory, in the, in the, in the field, et cetera. Okay. This fact was recognized by McCarthy and later by Kunch. However, unlike McCarthy, Kunch tied the Muskinga method to the properties of the governing diffusion wave. And he was able to relate the routing parameters parameters to the geometric and hydraulic characteristics of the reach. This is the Muskingum River a photo that I picked out somewhere on the web because I was never there. I was in Ohio, actually, I take that back. Marietta, Ohio. Uh, back in the year 1998, 1997, I think 1997. I went to Ohio on some business and I decided that I was about four hours, five hours from the Muskingum River, which is in Eastern Ohio. I was in Western Ohio. So I rented a car and went and saw the Muskingum River because I had, uh, you know, I had a, a fixation with the Muskingum River at the time. And this was in 1997, and I had been working on the Muskingum for 20 years. So I went over there and looked at the Muskingum, took some pictures, no videos at the time. It was 1997, and uh, unfortunately, the pictures for some reason got misplaced or got lost. I do not have pictures on the of the Muskingum River that I have taken. I'm waiting to go out there some other time, but given the circumstances at this point, I may not be able to make it. So demonstrate the simplicity of the Muskingum Kanch method, the former uh, uh, compared, compared to alternative hydraulic routing models. So what are we talking about hydraulic routing models in here? First, we were comparing with the Muskingum method and we said it's better, but now we're talking about comparing it to hydraulic routing models. The former remains a strong candidate. Okay, so I have not talked about hydraulic routing models. That is the next lecture. That's next Tuesday, prior to Thanksgiving. So let's leave that comment aside for a while. I'm saying at this point that the Muskinga method is easier than the hydraulic routing models. So let's leave that comment as such for the time being. Particularly the case when in view of the fact that hydraulic routing are generally unsuited for hydrologic applications. Thus the Muskinga Kanch emerges the only diffusion wave routing model, which is simple and accurate enough to be suited for large scale hydrologic modeling applications. And that is the reason why the Muskingum Kanj is part of HMS since 1990, and why RAS never picked it up, because HMS is hydrology and RAS is hydraulics. They never picked it up. They didn't have a need. Why? Because HMS is a watershed routing model, while HEC is a channel routing model. And in the channel routing, they didn't use it. If it's confusing, so be it, but that's basically it. That's the usage of it. That there is, that there should be uh, outside of the core, uh, channel routing with Muskingum Khan, sure. And we have done it in many instances, but the core does not, uh, in practice, it's really not so much used in hydraulics. It is used in hydrology. 
Okay. Must income can change computational accuracy. I'm going to have to speed up in here, otherwise. No, we're fine. We're fine. We're still fine. The strength of the Muskingum and Kanch method is clearly its theoretical basis. Kanch realized that the Muskingum method and the kinematic way model share the same theoretical basis. He was able to calculate the error of the first order numerical scheme and to tie this and to tie this error to the hydraulic diffusivity of the diffusion wave. That means the Hayami formula. This accomplishment paved the way for the calculation of routing parameters in terms of geometric and hydraulic variables thus circumventing the need for the expensive and impractical stream gauge measurement. Okay, so uh, Maskingam Kanch stability and convergence have, have been extensively documented both in theory and in practice. And we lead you to the paper by Pons and Bupalapati, one of our students, 2016. The method is strongly stable and with excellent convergence properties for Quran number in the neighborhood of one. This property of strong stability and excellent convergence properties all but assures its grid independence, the property of a numerical scheme to reproduce the same result regardless of grid resolution, regardless of the grid size. You can put any grid size in there and providing you, it's all being done all right, of course, numerically, it will give you the same answer regardless of the size of the grid. Don't forget, if you haven't picked it up yet, that the grid is totally artificial. The grid has nothing to do with nature. The grid is our way of getting to the problem. It's numerics, it's digits. It has nothing to do with the mechanics. So since there is a, a superposition in there between the physics and the mechanics, then you got to tie it in and you tie it through the Quran number. Without tying it through the Quran number, it doesn't work. Okay, in summary, the Maskinian unconscious is the only numerical analog of the diffusion wave equation based on a straightforward, explicit, point-by-point -point computation, all the while featuring grid independence no other flood method can claim this particular set of properties at this time. So we have the routing equations. We already covered this ground. The parameters as, as uh, following as Kanch. The five is easy. That is the grid celerity, rather not the, the K is the, the, the K parameter of the Muskingum is the delta X, which is the reach length over the celerity. So that means this is a time. The K is a time. Actually, it's referred to as the time of travel or travel time. Of, of a certain discharge through the reach of consideration. And the X is this X formula, well-known X formula, Kanch formula. Although I should tell you, and I did say that the other day, that Kanch did not develop this particular formula. He developed a somewhat related formula, which actually in reality meant the same. Kanch was using different parameters. He was using a hydraulic concept, which is called conveyance. And, and which is stated in Chao. Chapter six talks about conveyance. But my understanding is that most people don't really work with conveyance. So that threw a little bit of a monkey wrench in there for a formula that is expressed in terms of conveyance and people not using the conveyance. So therefore we changed it. And I say we, because the first people to change this was the British, 1975. It was Price, Price, Mr. Price, out of working out of one of the labs out there in uh, England they changed it and they put it this way. Linear and nonlinear routing. This goes back to the issue of the core that said that, that they couldn't get one value of K and X and they had to vary low, medium and high stages so that they could get several values, a set of values, a set of paired values of K and X. So we uh, referred to three asymptotic cross-sectional hydraulically Y with the beta five thirds, triangular beta, four thirds and inherently stable data three thirds, which is one, the beta is equal to one. Turns out that this is the shape, the shape of the inherently stable. I charged uh, Mr. Porras who came back, came to me in 1993 and he said he wanted to do a master's. I said, let's do this. He said, fine. You know, students usually do not disagree with the, or argue with the professor. I said, this is doable, it can be done, let's do it. And he did it. He wrote up a very beautiful thesis and subsequently, um, Marcela Diaz, who worked with me back in the middle of 2000, 2016, I believe, wrote this thing and put it on the web for, to calculate the cross-section. Not only the full cross-section, which is inherently stable, but the partially inherently stable, partially stable cross-section, which is kind of short, a little bit short. The partially stable cross-section will come from here and go over here. And the reason for that being, because this section works for true number infinity, Neutral, neutrally stable, neutrally stable fruit number of infinity. 
but we will never reach that. So this is an idealization, which is good to talk about, but it's not really good for practice. If you wanted to do it practically, then you could cut this thing, you shorten the width, but calculate the width so that you will not, so you would go up to a certain fruit number, which could be chosen between 20 or 25, because that's the maximum fruit number that could be achieved in practice. In other words, why would you design a channel for fruit number 50 when you're never gonna reach there? You will never reach there because nature didn't put it that way. Nature has a, a lower, the lowest, uh, like I said, the floor value for friction. You cannot get friction zero. If you get friction zero, we can live in this, in this planet. We'll be slipping all over the place, going from here to there and never achieving anything. But there is friction, which allows us to move. Friction allows us to move. So, so in this case, um, if friction were zero, we could reach infinity but friction is not zero. The actual number is about 20, 25. That has been demonstrated and proven. The program and paper written by Marcela Diaz talks about this back in the year 2016. Okay. <clears throat> we have the linear approach and the nonlinear approach. And the issue is here, why do one versus the other? Well, the linear approach is an application of the Maskingam kind based on the Maskingam. But you could vary the parameter minutely within the grid, within the grid, within the size of the grid cell or the, the, the grid. And therefore you can vary, you can make it nonlinear. In other words, solving in one whack, what the Army Corps said that it could be done in three because they were choosing low, medium and large stages. We could do this for all stages in one whack, in one shot. If we just vary the parameters from grid cell to grid cell. And we did that in the year 1978 and it works reasonably well. The only problem is there's a problem, problem of the mass conservation, which we at the time were not able to solve, but we said it was so small that it's not worth worrying about it. It's less than 1%, less than 1%. But I know that over the last 30, 40 years since we've done this, other people around the world have tried to fix the Muskingum Kanch nonlinear to make it zero mass loss, which is good. I have not pursued that because we have some other things to do that, like I said, we open up, but we don't follow it for the simple reason that I already told you. We should not really complete the work. We should let other people complete it later on. And other people have, it's my knowledge, they have been working on this for many years now on making the Muskingum Kanch nonlinear totally mass conservative. So the Muskingum Kanch represents a considerable improvement in computational accuracy. The only caveat is that the parameter should be based on values that are representative. Again, this is the third time I said that because I consider that to be important. To, to accomplish this objective, it is recommended that GIS supported geometric and hydraulic data be used to better estimate the relevant input data and variables on which to base the calculation of the routing parameters. That's the actual problem in application because I guess, I guess what I'm going to say in here is that this particular step of developing the cross-section parameters appears to be the stumbling block in here for full applicability of the Muskingum Kanch. In summary, the Muskingum Kanch is reviewed if to further clarify its theoretical basis and encourage its wider acceptance and use in current hydrologic engineering practice. Its theoretical background and computational accuracy are reviewed and clarified. The method is recognized to be the only numerical analog of the diffusion wave equation based on a straightforward, explicit point-by-point -point computation, all the while featuring grid independence. We note that no other fraud writing method can claim this particular set of properties at this time. And to close, there's another story that I'm gonna share with you. Uh, we did all this work in 1977, but then in 1986, we applied it to the, um, to the watershed because we realized at the time that it was okay for the channel is beautiful, good theory, but very few people are, were gonna be interested in applying it. But for the watershed, it was important. So I sat down and worked the paper called Diffusion Wave Modeling of Catchment Dynamics in 1986, which I believe is the real application of this concept because it's at the watershed level. And there was a great paper. And then in 1987, I got noted by Army Corps and invited me. And then three years later, they adopted my methodology. I already shown and told you that. In 1990, they adopted my methodology in their version, in their fourth version, number four, version number four of HEC1. And then in the year 1998, they converted HEC1 to HMS. 
HGC one no longer exists. That was a uh, character soul version, old version, right? That had been around for 30 years. Because in 1968 is when uh, one of the top engineers over at the Army Corps at, um, at what, uh, Oakland, I think it was, Oakland. Uh, because the Army Corps has field offices and how can I say districts, districts, Army District. And our, they, they took the leadership of developing the Hydrologic Engineering Center in 1968 in Sacramento, I think it was, the Sacramento District, right, Sacramento. It was not, it was Sacramento. So 1968, uh, they developed or they created the Army Corps of Engineers Hydrologic Engineering Center in Sacramento to develop hydrologic software. As a matter of fact, it is my belief that they outright created the name hydrologic engineering at that time. Because up to 1968, all of us were hydraulic engineers. They were no hydrologic engineers. They were engineers that did hydrology, but they called themselves hydraulic engineers. But then in 1968, like I said, people at the Army Corps decided that hydrology had reached maturity and that they could call themselves hydrologic engineers. So that was 1968. Yeah. Fast forward 30 years to 1998. That's when they felt the need to change to GUI. They felt the need. Why? Because computer use had evolved in the early 90s, and people had already developed GUI formulations. Uh, GUI means uh, graphical user interface, meaning Windows. Prior to 1990, I would say, very close 1990, the work was uh, the CRT, the character cell, the, the, the shell, the shell. Okay, it was not Windows because in the computer, in computer world, you can use the shell or you can use Windows. The shell is old, the Windows is new. How new? 1990, 1995. That's when Windows came about. And then, of course, uh, Bill Gates uh, uh, developed um, Microsoft and he started to selling the Windows uh, operating system. He basically, in my opinion, allow me to say this, he appro appropriated the word Windows from the English language to his own company. That is correct, it cannot be stated in any other way. And why I say that? Because prior to that, there were Windows, there was X Windows that we were using a little bit here and there, but no, he became popular and dominated and still dominates the entire market around the world, not Bill Gates, uh, Microsoft. That we, Microsoft is not Bill Gates anymore, I think so. He may have some interest, but he's no longer in command. But the point, that's besides the point. So we finish in here by saying that um, no other flow routing method can claim this particular set of properties. But I did say that I had applied the methodology 19, 19, 1986, then 1990, then they put it together. So it, it became important because the core, the Army Corps had endorsed it. But then the question is, how about the world? Did the world was the world using them but this methodology in their catchment writing models and the answer is well we have to wait and see now there's a model in europe called the she model and stands for she stands for system hydrologic um european it's french actually system hydro i don't speak french hydrologic european the she model very common very popular it's actually an alternative to hms a European alternative to HMS that is a Army Corps US model. And I say that because in many, in many places that worth their salt, they use both models and compare them, okay? So I was invited to go to Mexico in the year 2013. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was 13, it could have been 12, 12 or 13, it doesn't matter. And I, I sat for lunch with a group of lecturers. They had invited eight lecturers for a student conference. I was one of them. And I sat down together right next to a gentleman from Ottawa. So I, uh, I, um, I uh, engaged him in conversation and I said, uh, I don't even remember his name or how he looks, but we were together, we had to be civil, you know, we were together at a lunch, an intermission from the conference. So I said, well, you, where are you guys, where are you from? And he says, well, I'm, I'm from Ottawa, Canada. And I work with uh, Danish Hydraulics, Danish Hydraulics Institute, DHI. They are the ones that originated computational hydraulics in Europe back in the early 60s. 
and they're ahead, they're ahead. They're, they're a private company and they're all over the world actually selling their models. Okay, I am not sure to be honest with you is the she model is Danish hydraulics. At this point, I'm drawing a blank in here. I believe it is. I'm not sure, I have to check that. It's easily checked. But at any rate, there's a she model, European, that I already mentioned and then Danish hydraulics. So I said to him, oh, what are you guys getting into? I was just curious, you know, I, I meant no harm, I just curiosity. And he says, well, you know, we are actually applying the diffusion model to our models, to our watershed model. We are actually applying the diffusion model to our watershed routing models. Meaning it could have, it could have been she, by the way. I was really surprised and I didn't really know at the time. Well, I was not aware at the time that um, he was he was actually doing that work, but I was very pleased because that meant in the year 2013, they were picking up my stuff that had been done in 1986. I did not say anything, but I'm telling you, I'm sharing you the true story, which I have not told on the web, but it is a good story. Of final recognition of the work. We believe that stuff is really good. And Army Corps already did it in 1998, and she was doing it in the year 2014. Eventually, everybody will get there. Um, there's a, I have a couple more stories on the subject, but I'm not going to get, dwell on it because we need to make progress in here. So let me just go back in here. And now we're going to do the Muskingum Kanch amplitude and face portraits with online computation. And in this one, hold on to your seats because this is tough. And I certainly do not expect you to swallow or dig into all this stuff. It's impossible. It will take you months as it took Bavia. It took, uh, this was a project with Bavia. Uh, Bavia wanted to do a special study. Now wanted to, have to do a special study. We, we require every student that graduates with a master's degree at San Diego State to do some research with a professor. So the way it works is they go to the professor, they identify the subject, either structures, you know, the usual stuff, environmental, construction, and then they identify a problem and then they work four months, uh, entire semester. So Bavia came to me and said, I need to work with, I need to work a, a project. It's called a special, a special project or special research, 798. It's called 798. So I, I signed her up or he, she signed up with me to do this project. And I said to her, you are going to review the Kanch, which I'm going to give you because I already had, uh, I had already worked with Kanch's formulas. And uh, I had actually improved them a little bit. And I said, you're gonna work with the Kunch formulas and uh, you're gonna write a calculator. That's basic, but in order to write it, and write a paper on HTML, in the process, you'll learn HTML. That was my, that has always been my, uh, my call to teach people HTML because they don't know. Okay, so she said, fine. So she did learn HTML. She did learn Kunch. She did learn uh, the actual problem that we're facing in here. Uh, and by the way, Vavia was a, was a very highly qualified mathematical person. Pretty much like Nicole Lucitelli. Remember Nicole Lucitelli? Uh, I mentioned to you about her uh, with the, in connection with, uh, with the, um, the ponds, the ponds uh, representation of the unit hydrograph. At any rate, I don't remember right now. I handled so many things. The point is that Nicole was also good. But Nicole's problem was a, lot, a little bit simpler than this one. This is a very tough problem. When I did this problem originally following the work of Kanch and fixed Kanch, by the way, because Kanch had made some mistakes. Uh, that was back in the year 1978, 1980, 1980. So that was 40, how many years ago? 42 years ago. Okay, so the concept of amplitude and phase portraits in computational hydraulics is due to Lendersee. Who was Lendersee? Lendersee was a gentleman originating in Holland who had come to the United States and wrote a couple of papers in how to, how to develop two-dimensional models in plan, in plan view, because you can do a two-dimensional in vertical, two-dimensional in plan view, and so forth. So he wrote a couple of very good reports, actually, Lendersee, where he apparently introduced these concepts of amplitude and face portraits. And I say apparently because I don't know more than that. I read Lendersee and I thought it was not a novelty for me at the time. What did I know anyway? At the time, uh, there was the late 70s. Uh, I was just getting started. But we attribute, and, and largely uh, in, in the profession, 
the attribution of amplitude and phase portrait, portraits is given to Lendritzy. So the amplitude portrait is a plot of the ratio of numerical to analytical wave amplitudes. Okay. The, the phase portrait is a plot of the ratio of numerical to analytical wave celerities. So if you can pin down the amplitude, uh, uh, or rather the amplitude portrait and the, and the phase portrait, you will have pinned down the numerical accuracy of the computation. You'll be able to, if you say R equal R1 equal one and R2 equal one, then that means that the computation is exactly the same as the physics. That that doesn't happen in practice and the number is more like to be like 0 0.99, 0 0.98, 0 0.97. Well, there's another story. So then the issue is which parameters, first of all, they have to identify the parameters and how do they vary to determine the mobility or rather the answer of R1 and R2. That's the study that Lendersy did back in the year 1967 and Kanj did in the year 69. But like I said, Kanj had a bunch of, a couple of things in there that was not correct. Actually the paper by Kanj has three, three uh, I think three fundamental errors. And when I talked to my students over the years, 40 years, I always told them, I said, the best papers have errors and the students go like, oh, what? Yes, because the best papers are supposed to be at the forefront of knowledge and the writers don't know everything. If they knew everything, they wouldn't be in the forefront. You follow that? So Kanj was in the forefront and he made a couple of mistakes. No big deal. We can allow him to make mistakes because he was at the front, okay? Kanj basically said that there was no such a thing as kinematic shock, which is not true. But he outright came out and said it. Really amazing that you in such a top rated paper could find such a big mistake. At any rate, the objective of amplitude and phase portraits are to assess the stability and convergence properties of a given numerical scheme. We review the amplitude and phase portraits of the muskingum Kanch method, clarify their development, and, ex and, and ex further explain the details of the computation with aim to develop an online calculator. So the muskingum Kanch method, we already covered that ground, okay? Derivation of the equations, we already covered this ground. The, the, the thing about Kanj was this, and I'm going to, I said it already in computational hydraulics, but this is what happened. McCarthy was not a numerical man. He was working in the field and he was dividing this discharge against this other discharge and he found the method. How did he find it? Through sweat, after like Marcus after four years of working with the equations and finding that this equation was the one that best did the work. Four years of work, McCarthy, that's well known by the way, 1934 to 1938. It takes a lot of sweat in order to come up with an answer, a good answer like McCarthy's when you don't know the stuff, when you don't know the basic fundamental mechanics. Kanch knew the mechanics 35 years later, 30 years later. Kanch knew the mechanics, okay? So he set out to do numerical. And he was taking the kinematic wave equation and discretizing numerically. And lo and behold, he found out in not too, uh, in not, I, I suppose not, in not too much time that he was really solving the kinematic wave. It was the same discrete equation, the same numbers, the same shape of the equation that McCarthy had found in 1938, Kanch found in 1969. So then immediately Kanch said, this kinematic wave stuff, this equation number one is the Muskingum. It's the same equation. Just you need to look at it this way. It's the same equation. Okay, you got an X, you got a Y. It's the same, same thing. But then he asked himself, wait a second. This method is kinematic. According to Leighton and Widham, it should not diffuse. And yet it diffuses. Let me repeat. Because that's the crux of the matter. He said, this method is a, is a kinematic wave. According to where McCarthy originated kinematic wave. McCarthy did not know because there was no kinematic wave definition by the, at that time. So he, you could not uh, tell McCarthy about, to talk about kinematic wave because he didn't know. There was no such kinematic wave at that time. So then Kant reasoned quite well because he knew, he knew his math that it was a numerical diffusion problem. And he created at that time, the concept of numerical diffusion. Yes, there is diffusion in the Muskingum Kant, but the diffusion is numerical. So our job, said Kanj, is to figure out what is the coefficient of diffusivity of the numerical scheme. And that he did. And he came up with the equation that we have already seen. 
amply many times, okay? That equation that I said was modified by price in England, and then we used it too. So Kanch himself was very adept in math. He's a Polish gentleman, and apparently those people are very good at math. He's also a very smart guy. He developed, he decided to go to France and he ended up making his career in the, the total of, or the, the bulk of, of his career in France. He actually was an engineer with Sogrea. Sogrea is a company, it's a private company, engineering company in, um, in a Northern city, I believe. I'm not sure, I don't know too much about France, but the point is he was working, country was working in Sogrea and he it was in Sogrea that he developed this stuff. And he was very mathematically oriented, more than a typical engineer. So he decided to do this. He decided to do the computational, the, the Lendersy uh, phase, amplitude and phase portraits, and he did it. And I, at this point, my memory is a little bit fuzzy, but I believe that he made a couple of omissions in there. Why I say that? Because we reviewed this so many times, okay? He made a couple of omissions, so he did not complete the job. Basically, he messed up at the end. He could not express it completely as we would have liked to, and we had experience. So we decided to correct him, and we did correct him. And we came up, came, we came about in 1979 with a paper correcting his amplitude and phase portraits, which is this paper, by the way, is the same thing. So as you can see now, the going at stuff in here, because because now he's getting into the imaginary domain, which is the domain of um, of um, von Neumann. You guys have had the computational hydraulics have heard me talk about von Neumann. The von Neumann invented this equation number five. Well, actually he did not invent it. He just used it extensively in numerical analysis. And that's why his student, because he had a lot of students, he was a professor, I believe at Princeton. Uh, his students called this the von Neumann equation, Neumann, like N-E-U-M-A-N-N. -N. Originally from Germany, by the way, von Neumann or von Neumann. So this is a von Neumann equation that Mark, uh, the Kanji used, knowingly or unknowingly. I don't really know, but I know that we can tie the progression of the stuff to the 1945s to 50s, because von Neumann arrived in the United States in 1946, right after the war, and by 1950 he was very well established as a professor. And as a matter of fact, they say that he was instrumental in the development of the electronic computer in the U.S. Von Neumann. One of the people that developed the had a share, had a say in the development of the electronic computer, which came about in the nine, early 1950s, 54, 55. We already had a computer. Okay, that took a long time, by the way. So these uh, von Neumann equations had to be used in the discrete and in the uh, uh, um, analytic and discrete, and compare them in order to find out the answer that we are going to deal with. So take a look at this. I'm not asking you to review it for looking for errors. That would be that would be a high call. It would take you a month to do this. But uh, Vavia had a month. He had four months. She had four months. So she did it. And it's a testament to her patience and her decision in order to do this sort of stuff because it is it is tough. I did it on my own when I was young, and then Vavia did it. She was also young, and it can be done. It's just straight algebra, but it's, it's advanced algebra. You got to keep track of the eyes, the imaginary terms. You know, every time you square the imaginary terms, you end up with a negative or something like this. The square root of minus one is equal to I, the imaginary term, if you remember your math in here. You should, okay? I should tell you that when I went to Colorado State, I think I already shared this story with you, but it is a good story. I met with, at the start, with my professor, Daryl Simons, and he says, Pons, we have a lot of courses here. We have a big operation here. You can choose any course you want, typically in hydraulics, because they also had hydrology, they had this and they had that. But he says, I recommend that you take math 541. I said, really? <laughs> and he said, every one of our students takes it. That's the way he's put it. And that's the way he talked. I said, I'll take it. And I took it. And the, the fact that I took math coming out directly from the field. I was a field engineer prior to being there. It was a little bit rough, but not too much because I figured that I had no choice. And therefore I got into the math and I was able with that to do the S curve and many of the other things. I was not afraid of any of this stuff anymore after I took that class, which I passed with an A, but I had to work extremely hard, meaning learn a lot. 
Okay, so we have in here the stuff that Vavia put together and typed and made sure that there was no mistakes or anything like that because I also went over it and I was very familiar with the subject. And then we define the convergence ratios in order to get to the answer, right? So that's the convergence ratios over here. The convergence ratios R1 is this equation 48 and R2 is equation 50. And then we have we, have, we can calculate the convergence ratio using the calculator online masking gun conch convergence ratio. We put it into a calculator. First, let me show you what we did. We basically chose the three parameters that are controlling this, this, the accuracy of this computation. What are they? The Quran number between 0.1 and 4. The spatial resolution between 20 and 100. What does the special resolution refer to? It means the ratio between the physical length of the wave and the discretized space. So in here is 100. So 100 times is space steps in order to get to the wavelength. And in here, 20. Me, needless to say, this is coarse and this is fine. And fine is better than coarse. Why? Because what we're doing here is linearizing all the time. And if we have a hundred, um, rather a hundred grid sizes, we are the, the discrete points approximate very closely to the function, which is nonlinear. If it's 20, the approximation is not as good. So a hundred is better than 20. In here, the Quran number, I already said, 0.1 would be very low and four would be kind of high. So we want to try, and we already said that one has to be, uh, is the optimal the optimal value. And that is a rush, there's a rationale for that, by the way, but I, we don't have the time to get in there. And, and, uh, and the weighting factors, weighting factor is, and the weighting factor is gonna vary from between zero and 0.6. What's the weighting factor? That's the weighting factor of Muskingum. Now, McCarthy, when he was doing this in 1938, found out that he could not use X equal 0.6 because it was gonna give him garbage eventually. So he said, don't use greater than 0.5. So in here, why do we use 0.6? Because we want to show that in fact, we do get garbage because this method is good, okay? So in here at intervals of 0.1, so we have 14 graphs. So now I'm going to show you the results of the calculation that we found out in uh, with our computer program and then export it to Excel and plotted it in Excel. Excel is good for plotting, I can say that. I admit that because we've done it hundreds of times. Okay, so we have the R1 in here in terms of the Quran number, for the amplitude portrait for x equals zero, which is, which is uh, the, low, the lowest value for x. And you get the, this amplitude portrait and the face portrait. And look at that, for 20, bad, really bad. For 10, no, for 40, not so, for 100, it is to be good, 98% for x equals zero. That means that the answer is 98% of the physical, the numerical answer is 98% of the physical answer. That's for the amplitude. What about for the face? Same thing, we're 98% for the 100. So we recommend at least 100. We wanted to get, and why at least 100? Because we have such powerful computers that for us 100, 100 is okay. 50 is why you use 50 when you can use 100, right? So 100 is a good number for the resolution, spatial resolution. Now for x equal 0.1, which is a little higher, you get these answers for amplitude portrait and for the face portrait it gets getting better. Can you see that it's getting better? It's going up a little bit. Yes, it's going up. Barely, but it is going up. Amplitude phase point two still continues to go up. The trend is up. Point two is up. Point three, point three is very close to where it should be. Look at this amplitude. The 100 is over here at 99.5%, 99.7%. In the phase portrait, and 99.7% in hydrology is already correct. So don't, don't mess around. I mean, I already told you hydrology is fuzzy. Then here we're looking at 90, 99%. Over here for 0.3, how interesting. The face for straight started going positive, meaning bad. It should not go positive. Actually take that back. It's just, the answer is one. So if you get 1.01 1 .1 over here, it's a little bit exceeding what it should be, right? But interestingly enough, it is at 0.3, that these face portraits are going positive. Look at this, this was not, did not go positive. This one is going positive. Then amplitude portrait for 
he goes even closer and the face portraits, it, it, it goes more positive even. And for 0.5, how about that? For 0.5, the answer is correct. Why? Because that's the kinematic, the solution of the kinematic wave and it has to be correct. So that's what it is. That's the, face, the amplitude portrait, but the face portrait, there is a slight difference. But listen to this, but the only accuracy, perfect accuracy in here is given for Quran number equal one. Everything else for Quran number equal four, you get 0 0.9, that's bad. Okay, after being at 99, now 0 0.9 will be bad, but that's 20, 40, 60, 80, 100. 100 is still good, but you have in here this, a little bit derogatory statement in here going positive for 0.5 for the face, but the amplitude, the amplitude is perfect no matter what resolution. So there's gotta be something in there. And that the, the, the something is that there's the kinematic wave solution, at least for the amplitude. Now let's go to 0.6. That's the last one we did. At 0.6, definitely misbehave. The amplitudes are going up higher, higher than one, meaning blowing up. In the face portraits, the same thing, but the amplitudes is the one that, uh, that are really showing badly in here, okay? So the conclusion is that we should not use 0.6. We should use 0.5 at maximum. What value should you use? Well, you can pick up typically 0 0.3, 0 0.4 is better according to these amplitude and phase portraits, by the way. And these amplitude and phase portraits have hold or to tell nothing but the truth. There is no other truth. There could be other truth if we had made a mistake, but we have reviewed this many, many times. We did not make a mistake and it reproduces what Kant is saying anyway, right? So the analysis in here is that perfect convergence is achieved for X equal 0.5 and Quran number equal one. So that's the Quran number equal one is important. Convergence in both amplitude and phase improves with an increase in spatial resolution, that is correct. Convergence in both amplitude and phase degrades with an increase in Quran number, particularly for, for, for C greater than one. Convergence in amplitude and phase improves, or in amplitude improves with an increase in X in the range. And convergence in phase improves slightly with an increase in X in the range. So we already analyzed that. We conclude that the muskingum Kanch method is a good representation of the physical prototype, provided the spatial resolution is sufficiently high, say 100. The Quran number is close to one, say one. Can you fix the Quran number equal one? And the answer is yes. In, in computer modeling, you can. Because all you need to do is just choose the delta X so that the Quran number of the physical problem gets to be Quran one. And that can be that. It's been done by Army Corps and it's been done by Professor Pons. My overland flow calculator does precisely that. Because if it doesn't do that, it'll blow up. It is uncontrolled. The only way to control this computation is to fix the Quran number equal one and it can be done. The weighting factor is high enough in the range 0.0 to 0.5. So practical application, we have in here a practical application because I know I realize there's a lot of, this is a lot of difficult uh, theoretical stuff. So we are going to run in here, okay? We're gonna run in here a calculator, online masking I'm conversion ratios. Let me see if I can do this right now. I have a couple of minutes here because I need, I need the data and I'm, I don't wanna go back and forth. So I'm going to go in here. I'm hoping that I'll be able to do this. Muskingum crunch. Muskingum crunch conversion ratio, there it is. Practical, there it is. Okay, here we go, we got it. I got it. I went to my calculator calculator pay, page. I found that out the calculator page. Why, am I, why, why did I do that? Because I wanna run this example and I don't wanna go back and forth. Okay, so the, now I'm gonna say mean velocity, 175. Actually, I have it all in there already. I did it this morning. Mean velocity, 175. Mean flow depth, 2.3 over here. Mean channel slope, 0 0.068. Wait a second. Mean channel slope. He, uh, no, 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 that's, that's not good. That's not good. I'm very confused in here. 
Hmm. How interesting. Let me just try that. Okay, uh, rating exponent, rating exponent, 1.6. Flood wave time of rise, 24. Reach length, 4,800. No, reach length, yeah, 4,800, right. Okay, I got, I think, in time interval, 0.5. 0.5. So there's one in here that is not quite agreed with what I just did in here. Maybe I just should put in there 0 0.013. There it is, there it is, I'm sorry, 0 0.013. I was trying to look for it while I did this afternoon correctly. So now I got this data in here, let me double check in here. I got a couple of minutes, 175, 2.3, 0.0013, 1.6 for the beta. 24 for the flood, flood wave re, time of rise, 3,800. Okay, so now I'm gonna run this. And I forget that I'm doing these calculations on the go in here, and I'm trying to, I'm trying to figure out uh, lender C ratios. The lender C ratios are one and R2. And in the paper, we say that it's 99953, and the calculator is 99953. The R2 is 9999915, 9999915. So we did it correctly. So why did we do this? We did this for the purpose of showing the practitioner that he or she could pick up some numbers in here as I have done and figure out what the R1 and R2s are. Just to kind of show where, where we are. And that way we did it. This is as, as good as it could get. This 99.953 is one out of a thousand one half out of a thousand. And in here is, is one out of 10,000 error. So that's very good. So with that, I will finish off in here on the conclusions by saying comprehensive review of the Muskingum and Gunch amplitude and phase port rates is accomplished. Expression for the, expressions for the amplitude convergence ratio and phase convergence ratio are developed as a function of spatial resolution, ground number and weighting factor. In online calculator, online Muskingum Kunch conversion ratio, ratios, and we also have practical calculation by putting actual physical values as I have done in here. So with that, I finish off the uh, the Muskingum Kunch, and our next um, we now have how many sessions? Uh, we have only one, right? We have only one session. So we're gonna move on in here of nine, 10, all the way to 18, 19. So we're actually gonna mostly skip this stuff and gonna go directly over here to 14. So 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19 is what we're gonna do next Tuesday. Thank you very much. I'm going to stop to share now. And, um, and uh, our next meeting is next Tuesday. No, Monday, I'm sorry. Wednesday, there is no class because we have a Thanksgiving holiday and it is the practice of the California State University to uh, give us two days of holiday. Actually, it's three days. So we don't have a class Wednesday or Thursday. Thank you very much. So